to make a slide here. Quite simple. Uh, you remember you open up turning point, so you're sitting in PowerPoint, but you're in the turning point enabled version of PowerPoint. If you're just sitting in PowerPoint, you won't be able to see any of these options. You're uh, maybe, you know, maybe you're just, you just open it up and you say, okay, well, I want to put in a slide with a question, so I click on the turning point tab, and now you see this new set of icons up here, and this one, the, the common one you would say is, I, well, I want to insert a slide, and I want it to be a question. All kinds of ways you can make the questions. Uh, you can make them multiple choice or true false. Uh, they have I haven't really used it, but you can have essay slides and stuff there. I'm not sure. I'm not even sure what you would do with the essay slide. Um, and then it looks like uh, stuff I haven't seen before, but they haven't made it. They've made it easier to uh, show who's on what team and how the teams are scoring during the course of things. I, I tell you, one of the most popular things I do is is before midterm before a final, I'll take half a class and I'll dedicate it to a quiz meet that's based on uh, questions that make me on the exam. Um, sort of a safe competition mode, they really seem to enjoy that and they seem to rise to the occasion and they want to win, especially if I, boy, if I put like 10 extra credit points on the table, um, <laughs> I can whip them into a frenzy. <laughs> so let's just uh, say, okay, let's uh, go with a vertical slide. And, and basically, if you've worked a lot with PowerPoint, you realize that it's just running around in there and putting in some special animations that you could uh, you can kind of build yourself if you have lots of time. But it's putting in a, a, a chart and a question and some answers. And as you you'll put this question in, and then as you begin to populate answers, it'll put more bars on the chart. So you could say. Uh, who is the UCM Chancellor? And you could put it on Arnold S. Or Steve K. Or Carol TK. Or uh, Jeff Wright. And you see that it, it's smart enough to know I, I now have four answers there, so it should have four bars. Um, some reason that it sort of sets them at some equal level to begin with. So um, if you were going to use this right away, you'd say, okay, let's just reset this slide. Careful not to reset the whole session because that would wipe out that data I just collected. Uh, but if you just reset the current slide, it puts everything down to zero. Uh, and um, could add some bells and whistles then. It's ready to go right now. It'll come up and you'll be in control of when they start and when they stop. But if you want to add some bells and whistles, you go to insert object, you say let's do a let's do a countdown. And you can put a little higher hourglass icon in. Make it a little bigger if you want. And so this guy will start counting down from 10 uh, when you um, when you hit the click, let's try to fire this up. And so the polling opens, and if uh, it's open now so people can respond, but if I hit the next button, you're on the clock, and you're going to get locked out of responding if you don't respond quickly enough. Will you change something if I press the right answer several times? Uh, this I, is the same, same I, I think what it, it grabs the first answer that registers, and, and then you're done. In the settings, you can change how many oh. times they're allowed to change their answer. Okay, well, that'd be interesting. <laughs> so, um, one thing you can do is you can you don't you can um, uh, assign you can well you should you should go in and you can tell the software which answer is right. Uh, you can maybe have different gradations of right and assign different levels of points to those answers. And you can also have it uh, downscale, downgrade the points with the timing so that speed speed would help win the day if somebody both, if two people answered the same question correctly. So it, it, it can be kind of fun. Wow, yeah, I'll be happy to hear that. <laughs>
So what, are, what have I tried to do? Um, like I said, I've really only scratched the surface. It, it would be fun if I had more time to, to play around with it. But what I do with them is I have what I call intra-lecture review questions, meaning that in the same lecture, I'll circle back to points I made. And I'm just sort of teasing them. Kind of helps supposedly with the retention. It also lets me know who's paying attention. And, and, and it often tells me uh, on some complicated points that I did not cover the point well, because I'll just see answers all over the map on a question that should be straightforward if I presented it pretty well. So that can be pretty nice. Uh, it's really kind of eliminated me walking back to my class, back, back to my office, trying to remember that next lecture I have to go back to that point because I can tell they didn't get it. I can fix things right away, kind of. Uh, then enter lecture uh, quest review questions. So then I might circle back to something from a couple lectures ago. And then you really start to get a feel for who's on the ball and who's, who's struggling to keep up. Uh, the third one, which I didn't really notice until recently, was, was it's really powerful for me to vet possible exam questions where I do have a lot of multiple choice questions with such a big class. You know, we have essay questions and a little bit of problem solving too, but kind of a nightmare to grade for 50 papers. So we use a lot of multiple choice as well. And you know, like everybody, sometimes I make them up and they seem great, but then only, you know, 10% of the class gets it right and you go back and you read it and you realize it's ambiguously worded and things like that. So uh, this way, uh, I, I, I really do um, get, get embedded well. And, um, and the students also will quickly, you know, they're very adaptive animals, they realize some of the questions from the clickers are appearing on the exams. Um, you know, and, and in some of that last third of the class that doesn't tend to come to class very much starts to show up a little more. So I mean, whatever it takes, I think, in some, some regards. As I said, some of the really fun things have been the quiz meets. The students really like that. Uh, I also do just some broadening information uh, outside the typical scope of the class, but an interesting co connection, you know, uh, and I'll show you an example of that. And, and with the clickers, it doesn't cost so much time. The clickers kind of keep me on a leash so I don't drift off on a big tangent. Yet they plant a connection between, say, some environmental problem that they're sort of familiar with, with a time in history and who was in office at that time and what was going on. And sometimes, uh, I've cut, cut myself off with some words here, but sometimes I just put in random humorous questions to provide a little comic relief or transition between topics in the class. So, for example, uh, I may have been in the context of a fossil fuel related lecture, and these are Shaw students, some of them political science students, so they like a little bit of connections. And I might ask something like, who were the U.S. presidents during the previous oil crises of the uh, 1973 and 1979. Sometimes it's hard for me to, to think back in the timeline and get these things right, too. So it's good to ward off Alzheimer's and things like that. <laughs> so you notice the little, this is the little bar on the bottom uh, where I, I would actually have an indicator of how many people out of the class have answered. And here, of course, only five people have clickers, so we're not going to get any further than that, but we get to see how people are doing. All right, you guys are getting serious now. <laughs> <laughs> how do you insert that on the bottom? That That's another insert object. It's insert object. Yeah. Okay. And another insert object that you can do, which is fairly important, they'll go crazy if you don't do it, is the, uh, is the correct answer yeah. indicator. They don't like that when you don't tell them. <laughs> But I do tease them, the handouts that I put on the web uh, on crops before class uh, don't have the answer on them. <laughs> and, um, and so if they want the answers, they either have to have a friend in class or come to class. Mm -hmm. Do you require your students to answer all of the questions? Or if they choose not to, that's okay? They don't have to answer them. Um, I, um, I do randomly uh, sample the answers from various classes in, in part. I have, a, I have sort of a, a rinky-dink attendance participation part of the class. And so I will see 
usually if a person's missed like more than 20% of the class, I would tend not to be so lenient on that part of the grade. But I don't look to see if they answered every question. It's a time issue probably more than anything. I mean, I'd like to see, uh, I would like to comb through the data and see if there's correlations between how accurate they are in class with how well they do on exams. All these kinds of things would be quite easy to tease out with a few extra hours. So this in the same lecture, I might ask something about our former president, I should have changed that slide, former president Bush, energy obtained from fission uh, is atomic energy, nuclear energy, Texas lightning in a bottle, or just like fusion. <laughs> <laughs> and I usually have a follow-up question about how, when, how the only, uh, when we had a trained engineer as the President Jimmy Carter, I have the same question, and it's the same answer, unfortunately, because <laughs> he pronounces it nuclear, even though he's a nuclear engineer. 